So imagine you were a free black person during the days of slavery. So you're free and there's people enslaved all around you. And to remain free, all you have to do is mind your own business. On the other hand, if you choose to get involved, maybe try to help somebody else get free, you run the risk of losing your own freedom. What would you do? Would you try to help someone get free or would you mind your own business? That was the choice that Reverend Leonard Andrew Grimes faced. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. Reverend Leonard Andrew Grimes was a, a Baptist minister in the 1800s who advocated for freedom. He was an abolitionist. He made it his life's work to um, do everything in his power to eliminate slavery as both a practice and as an institution. Now, the work that he and other abolitionists did uh, not only led to the abolition or the ending of slavery in the United States uh, and in Europe, but also it ended the Atlantic slave trade. So this was important, important work. It took a lot, a lot of effort to get done, a lot of time. Um, but ultimately, the abolitionist movement was in large part responsible for ending slavery, as we know it. So who was Leonard Grimes? Leonard Grimes was born to free parents on November 9th, 1815. Now, he was what you call a mulatto, meaning he was of mixed race. Typically, that's when one parent is white, one parent is black, or it could be one parent is mixed, one parent is black. But in any case, by modern standards, he would have just been considered black. And the date of his birth puts it about 50 years before slavery ended in the state where he was living. He was born in 1815. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued by Lincoln in 1863. And uh, slavery wasn't, wasn't abolished in Virginia until 1864. So imagine living your life as a free black person where all around you, you see people enslaved uh, for the better part of your life growing up under those conditions. Imagine how that would feel. See, somebody in that situation basically has two choices. And as I mentioned earlier, you could you could turn turn a blind eye to it. I mean, he is mixed. He could have said that, uh, you know, well, I'm free. I'm a free man. That's not my condition. It's not my concern not my business. I need to live my life, do the best I can and make the most out of my life, my life as I can. He certainly had that choice. Um, also, he had the other choice of trying to do something about it. Again, if you were in that situation, what would you do? If you knew that if you did try to do something about it, you could end up just like them slaves over there that you're looking at. Would you do anything? Would you get involved? Now, granted, conditions, arguably conditions weren't as bad as uh, as they were in the deep south where he was. But he, as an employee, he traveled to the deep south with his uh, slave owning employer on many occasions. And uh, he got to witness some of the things that the slaves went through on a firsthand basis, the mistreatment, the beatings, the uh the hard labor, the, the brutality, and in some instances, hanging. He got to see all of this firsthand. And because of this, he made the decision that he was going to do everything in his power to free as many people as he possibly could. So sometime in the 1830s, he moved to Washington, D.C., and he got into a business. He was a hackney driver. A hackney driver is, is basically a taxi cab driver. The word hackney is it comes from a French word, um, meaning it, it meant a horse that was available to be rented. So he drove a coach, right, a horse-drawn carriage, um, just like a taxi driver would, and he would transport politicians and other people around the city. In addition to that, the records show he got married, married a woman named Octavia, and they had four kids together. There was Emma. There was John, there was Leonard, and there was Julia. So both his official occupation as a hackney driver 
and his status as a married family man painted the image of a um, upstanding law-abiding citizen which served as perfect cover for some of his other activities. He was a conductor for the Underground Railroad. Now this was an extensive network of people, both black and white, who provided food, shelter, clothing, and most importantly, transportation to slaves who were escaping to freedom. His cover allowed him to operate as a conductor for several years undetected. Nobody had a clue what he was doing. However, just like playing the game of baseball, nobody can consistently hit home runs and never strike out. And that's exactly what happened uh, while transporting a family to freedom. Leonard Grimes struck out. He was caught. He was arrested and he was imprisoned. So in reference to the choice I mentioned earlier, would you get involved? Leonard Grimes chose to do so. And while helping one family escape to freedom, his family lost their provider and their protector. His wife and his children had to fend for themselves. If you knew that was a possibility, what would you do? Thankfully, his, his family, his wife was not helpless. She held the family down while he was locked up. Um, and she earned money by teaching um, African-American kids in Negro schools. Um, and she, and I'm certain maybe with a little bit of help, managed to keep the family together and afloat while he was imprisoned. And thankfully, he only served two years in jail. But while he was there, he found God. So when he was released, he got baptized and he became a man of the church. Not long after that, he was licensed to preach. In 1846, he moved his family to Massachusetts and began to get involved in the community in that area. In 1848, he gained ordination as the first pastor of the 12th Baptist Church. And he held that position for the next 27 years. And being in that position, opened up some doors for him to do some of the things that um, were near and dear to his heart to continue to fight for black people in America. In 1850, there was something called the Compromise of 1850. Now, the Compromise of 1850 was a set of five laws that were created in response to uh, expanding territories and slavery in the United States. You see, there was a balance between uh, the free states and the slave-holding states, pretty much even as far as power was concerned. But around that time, California was seeking to be admitted into the Union. California wanted to be admitted as a free state. And what that would do would upset the balance of power. Uh, those folks in the South, uh, the ones who, the slaveholders, they didn't take kindly to that. And this was right before the Civil War. Uh, there was an uproar. So the Compromise of 1850, part of that compromise what was, was what was known as the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act. Um, and what this law stated was that, uh, well, for one, it abolished slavery in Washington, D.C. Good thing, right? But a part of that act was that um, slaves were required to be returned to their masters. Fugitive slaves escaped no matter where they were apprehended, were required to be returned. And in addition to that, the federal government was obligated to assist in ensuring that this happened. So the capture, uh, the, the, the trial, all of that responsibility was given to the federal government by law. And this was something that didn't set well with uh, the Reverend Grimes, nor the members of his church. 
Um, so they, they made it a point to, to try to put up as much resistance to this as possible. Grimes uh, also served as president of the American Baptist Missionary Convention. And um, in that role, working with other churches, other church leaders, they managed to create an environment in which the church would, churches would refrain from associating with slaveholding churches, um, which meant that any any church that was in support of slavery, couldn't they, they couldn't associate. So in that way, he used the power of his position within the church and the power of the church to fight against slavery. He worked with other abolitionists, uh, folks like um, Theodore Doughty Miller, Samson White, if you've heard any of these names, these, these, these men worked together along with others to, to make these things happen. And it was that teamwork that, that made the dream work. For instance, 1854, there was a slave um, by the name of Anthony Burns, he escaped from Virginia, went to Boston and became a member of Grimes' church. Uh, his master found out where he was and ordered that he be returned. He wanted him arrested and returned. Um, Grimes and his church, they, they argued against that, but ultimately they couldn't, they couldn't fight the law. Burns was um, apprehended. He was placed in jail. The trial went forward, and the judge, according to the law, had to order that he be returned to his master. Fortunately, while all of this was taking, was taking place, uh, the church, Grimes and his church members and others, they'd raised enough money to purchase Burns' freedom. So that's what happened. Uh, they, they used that leverage, that power, that community to purchase his freedom so they didn't have to be returned. That case drew a lot of attention. The public made their thoughts known. And it so happens that that was the last time that uh, anyone was prosecuted under the Fugitive Slave Act in Massachusetts ever. So that's a testament of what, what can happen when people set their mind to accomplishing a certain end. Leonard Grimes is also a, an important figure in the, um, the uh, colored conventions movement. Colored conventions movement was basically, these conventions was getting all the best and the brightest of, of black minds together in one place. I mean, everything from uh, businessmen to politicians to publishers, to writers, editors, um, the thinkers the thinkers, getting these folks together um, so that they could work together to advance the condition of colored people in America. The organization was said to provide an organizational structure to which black men could maintain a distinct black leadership and pursue black abolitionist goals. Grimes was a delegate to the conventions in 1853, 1855, and 1859. Now, so what were these conventions really? I mean, were they just these meetings where they got together and they talked about a few things? Um, and and con <laughs> on the contrary, these were, uh, they got the work done. Okay, these, they, these people were putting in work and they were discussing some high level topics. The, min the minutes of the meetings tell the, the, the real story. And if, uh, if you didn't know any better, you would have never thought that these types of conversations were happening back then. This is before the Civil War. And I'm going to list out some of the things that they were discussing. And tell me if you think any of this sounds the least bit familiar. Ready? Here we go. They were talking about labor, health care, temperance, immigration, voting rights, the right to a trial by jury, and educational equality. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like a lot of the conversations you hear happening right now, today, 150 years later, 160, 70 years later? Isn't that weird? Doesn't that seem kind of odd to you? Think about the conversations. They were talking about voting rights then. They were talking about real voting rights, as in the right to vote. Think about the conversations you hear now about voting rights, except conversations usually put forth in a manner that makes it seem as if black folks aren't intelligent enough to 
to simply go down and get an identification card so they can vote. You need an ID for all these other things. It's, it's hard. You'd be hard pressed to find a black person who doesn't have, adult who doesn't have ID. But somehow, we have all these people running around talking about voting rights as if we're not intelligent enough to do the basic requirements to vote. It's as if we've gone backwards. <laughs> that could be that could be a long conversation. I'm not going to go there. I digress. If you do your homework, you do your research, and you find out some of the things that took place over a century ago, and you contrast those with the, some of the things that happen right now, you should be insulted. You should be really insulted as a black person in America right now to hear some of the things that are being said. It's, it's, it should really bother you. And if it doesn't, it's probably because you just don't know any better. It's also interesting to note that these colored conventions existed before any other formal um, uh, anti-slavery movement in the United States. And these were black people, organization of black people doing this that laid these foundations down. And, and often it's made to seem like, like help had to come from somewhere else. Uh, but they were doing it themselves. And then the Civil War happened. And then you have to ask the question, what, what other things have happened to distract black people from doing it themselves? Why did we not continue to do it ourselves at that high of a level? It's a great question. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that in the comment section below. Grimes also played a major role in manning the 54th Regiment, Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Now, it was one of the first African-American regiments to serve in the American Civil War. It formed in 1863. Basically, a lot of the members of his church wanted to fight against the Confederates in the South, also other blacks that he was connected to. And because of his personal beliefs as well, he advocated for black soldiers to be able to fight against the Confederacy. Now, the arm, the military, the army wasn't integrated at that time. So, uh, his solution or the solution that they came to by creating an all black infantry unit basically solved two problems. One, blacks were allowed to fight, they were allowed to join the fight, and two, whites weren't forced to integrate their small units. Now, once they were successful in creating the units, Grimes pushed forward to recruit soldiers to fight, uh, black soldiers to fight. He was he was uh, he was important uh, as far as getting these units manned. So basically, there you have them in a nutshell. Uh, the Reverend Leonard Andrew Grimes was a important black abolitionist and pastor who spent the, the better part of his life working to, to free black people and also to help to improve their condition. In 1873, Reverend Grimes fell sick and subsequently passed away. Um, he was still working at that time, still trying to get things done. And his death was listed, the cause of death was listed as something called apoplexy, which basically translates into um, uh, a ruptured organ. Typically, it's a, it's a brain. It's a stroke. He died of a stroke. Doctors don't really use that term anymore. Usually, they point to the specific organ that's involved, but basically, he died of a stroke. And that was at his home in East Somerville, Massachusetts, near Boston. Just a fun fact I thought I would share. If you like it, like it. If you have any comments, leave them in the comment section below. And if you think it's shareable, share it with someone else you think might enjoy it. On that note, take care, family. Peace.